So in this quick session, we're going to look at the ways in which the disorder specific assessment seeks to understand the emotional problem that the patient is presenting with so that the right treatment can be given in line with NICE guidelines. So the aims of a, a disorder specific problem based assessment are that the um, because we have different evidence base for different treatments. So for example, the treatment for um, PTSD is very different, even though both CBT based for the treatment for um, GAD or panic or OCD, or for example, CBT might not be the treatment of choice at all. So for example, PTSD for some patients, a better suitable treatment might be EMDR, or for other patients presenting with things like um, eating disorders, interpersonal therapy might be the treatment. So again, at the early stage of the assessment, the whole point of funneling and trying to understand what the problem is, is to ensure the right NICE guideline treatment is applied, which may or may not be a therapy offered within IAT. So the idea of the problem-based assessment is that as a practitioner, you're applying your knowledge of the DSM-5 symptoms of different diagnostic categories Using that alongside your clinical knowledge of things such as the cognitive themes, the way the, the specific thinking changes in each disorder and trying to assess the differences, not the similarities. And that's really key. Often people struggle most with assessing between different anxiety disorders because there's lots of crossover symptoms. So there's lots of shared things that happen across the anxiety disorders. But there are also specific differences and that's the aim of this assessment is that it's patient centered, the patients describing their experiences, their own worldview of their problems, their own unique experiences, their idiosyncratic presentation. But the clinician is there to be able to fit that understanding into the relevant diagnostic category or categories and come to a decision about a primary diagnosis, any secondary diagnoses that there might be also, and the differential diagnoses. So they're the diagnoses that have been excluded as you're funneling and you've got a clear understanding of why you've excluded them and why you know it's not that difficulty. So we do that knowing that comorbidity is common. Um, so that's where we have primary problems, the primary presenting problem or secondary or tertiary problems as well. And the idea within um, a, this type of assessment is that we make a decision based on NICE guidelines, based on the evidence about which is the primary presenting problem to treat. So quite often there's a view out there, if there's depression, you always treat the depression first. And that's not actually the case in line with NICE guidelines. So for the majority of problems, you might treat the depression first. However, if there is an anxiety disorder, a specific comorbid anxiety disorder that is the primary presenting problem, then that may be the treatment, to, that, that might be the problem to focus on first. And we make that decision based on the order of the problem, the severity of the problem and the disorder specific measure scores, which came first and which is having the most impact for the patient at the moment. And also what NICE guidelines says. So for example, for social anxiety disorder, the NICE guideline very clearly stipulates what to treat first in, in a range of different comorbidity situations. So we should always be using our disorder specific knowledge, our knowledge of the presenting problem and the one that's most impactful for the patient, and also our knowledge of NICE guidelines as we go through. So the reason that we talk about emotions and the reason it's the problem based assessment is emotion based is emotions have a core set of symptoms. So emotions have physiological changes, autonomic physiological changes. So that isn't just physical symptoms, that's physical symptoms that happen automatically in response to that emotional state. So for example, when you are in a threat related situation, the body will physiologically automatically change and invoke what we call the adrenaline response. So you will have your um, sympathetic system will activate and that will um, enable you to run away, seek safety, or to, um, if necessary, to fight. So it's the fight, flight, freeze, or flop response. And you can faint as well. So the body chooses one of those states to go in in a really quick decision based on um, the, the way in which the, the, the threat has been analyzed by the body. 
so it's a fantastic system that we all have but in the sense of anxiety disorders sometimes that system is happening out of context for the person when it doesn't need to so it's overestimating a threat in a non-threatening situation so we all have emotions they all have a set of physical symptoms but they also have a set of subtly different behaviors as well and a set of subtly different physical uh, cognitive symptoms so a theme in each disorder and knowing the core autonomic behavioral and cognitive symptoms from the dsm and from our knowledge of the disorders together helps us identify the correct problem in a succinct way in this type of assessment so knowing how this presents is really important so we'll walk through that now so you may notice that within PWP based assessments within the national curriculum, we have the ABC model of emotion. And that's because, as I've said, each emotional state within the DSM identifies a set of altered autonomic physical symptoms, a set of behavioral changes as a result, and a theme, a cognitive theme that within CBT based interventions, we understand as part of that presenting problem and put together our knowledge of the DSM and the themes helps us to identify what the presenting problem is. So the aim of the assessment and the, the early part of the assessment is that we are asking the patient for examples of situations in which they've had symptoms to try and understand what they do or don't do to try and manage them and modify them, what thoughts they have at the time of the emotional state, and then also what thoughts they might have pre or post as well. So the idea is we're using what we call the W questions alongside these, the what, the where, the when, the when not, alongside the ABCs to make psychological sense of the presenting problem that the person's experiencing at the moment. So that helps us do it in an idiosyncratic way. So their experience of a particular disorder will be unique to them and the situations that they're in in their life. But we're applying that idiosyncratic knowledge that the patient is sharing with us to help understand things from their perspective against those diagnostic categories. And that's so important to make sure we get the treatment correct because we don't want to apply the incorrect treatment that's not going to work for the particular presenting problem someone's going to have. So we talked about physical symptoms. So the autonomic symptoms are responses within the body that happen automatically in response to that emotion. And we know they're functional. And when we're assessing, it's the differences, the specific differences between the anxiety disorder states that we're really searching for to help identify the differences between which anxiety disorder is the primary. So what the presenting problem is. So, for example, in depression, there are a range of autonomic physical symptoms of depression that serve a purpose, though they have a function. So, for example, when someone's depressed in the DSM, it identifies difficulties with concentration with motivation, difficulties with sleep or appetite. So there are a range of ways of a range of ways in which the body responds physiologically to low mood and depression. And all of those are linked then to the way in which the, pa the patient alters what they do or don't do as a result and also their theme of depression. So all of these things we piece together to try and make sense of it. And in depression, because it's it's one presenting problem, that's quite easy to funnel and do in the main. It's the anxiety disorders that really we have to use really good funneling skills to make sure we're clear between the physiological changes within that, within the disorders, how the adrenaline response presents differently, and it does, how the behaviours alter differently, and how the thoughts alter differently, not just the similarities in terms of avoidance or escape. So it's the differences that we're trying to search for rather than the commonalities shared across anxiety disorders and that will help us get to the right presenting problem so alongside the physiological changes the autonomic physical symptoms we also assess about behaviors what the person's doing or not doing as a result and People often think that's because behaviours are a way to bring about change and that's because we often go in behaviourally to treat problems. And partly it is, but partly the behaviours are implicit within any emotional state. So there is a specific behaviours that occur when you're in a different mood state. So, for example, within depression, the implicit emotion within that is to withdraw, to avoid. And that gives some short term relief from the unpleasant physiological symptoms of depression and the negative thoughts of depression in the short term. 
but in the longer term, it keeps the problem going round. So what we're trying to understand is what does the patient do as a result to try and, of these symptoms to try and manage them? And how is that maintaining their difficulties or impacting for them at the moment? And emotion itself is actually um, a word that means to move, to act quickly. So it's a Latin word, emot livre. And the word is actually there. It, it's explicitly saying that actually the, the, the behaviours serve a function to take action. So if you have a fear-based, you take action. If you're depressed, you take action. So the autonomic and behavioural symptoms are linked in terms of the specific difficulty someone's experiencing at the moment. And similarly, there's a theme in each disorder and that theme helps us to identify what's going on for somebody at the moment. And when we're assessing, when we're funneling, being able to get into some situation specific examples of the problem in the here and now, when they're having those, that physiological change, when they're doing those behaviours, helps us to understand the thinking changes that have occurred for the person and make sense of that in, in, in terms of the presenting problem diagnostic categories that we know of. So the thinking changes also give us great insight into helping to understand which anxiety disorder it might be that someone's presenting with, because each has a subtly different theme. So we talk about the ABCs in a PWP assessment, and that's because each emotion has a core set of autonomic, behavioural and cognitive symptoms. And there's often confusion within um, PWP about the five areas CBT model. So the five areas CBT model, sometimes called the hot cross bun, does look at the autonomic, behavioural and cognitive symptoms. But in addition, it looks at the other things going on in the person's life. So what their situation is, what triggers the problem, what their overall kind of life situation and, and problems are. And it also looks at feelings. Either model is absolutely fine to use at step two. Both models are evidence-based. Both models are absolutely correct to use. So different courses teach the ABC or the five areas. Either is fine. The thing that's really important though is from the clinician's perspective, you are still doing the same thing within the assessment. Your role in the assessment is still to understand the autonomic, the thinking and the behavior, how these three areas interact and, and what diagnostic category they link to by gathering some specific examples of the problem in the here and now and doing what we call symptom clustering. And it's this box that unfortunately often trips clinicians up. So novice clinicians often make mistakes around this box because yes, absolutely, um, Chris Williams, colleagues that have, have used this model such as Christine Podetsky, et cetera. Um, the idea of this box is it's the patient's own view of their problem, it's their own words. That's what ideally what we're putting in there. But that shouldn't come at the expense of the clinician understanding what diagnostic category is presenting and how that fits in terms of the cluster of these symptoms against those categories. So as long as we get the correct thing here, this can be in the patient's own words, but these should be disorder specific and clear. And this one is the patient's um, personal way of describing how they're feeling at the moment. So it's a patient centered way of us ensuring that we understand how they're feeling about these presenting symptoms in the diagnostic category here. So this is basically the emotion. So for example, if somebody had altered thinking that there's no point now because their children have left home, that would fit in with a cognitive theme of actual or perceived loss. If they said they were tired, if they weren't sleeping well and lethargic, if they'd um, noticed that their appetite had gone down, if they'd noticed that they weren't able to concentrate, and for example, they described that they were doing far less than usual, not going out and seeing friends, off work at the moment, um, that they might have noticed that they're spending more time in bed, not sleeping. That fits with the diagnostic category of depression. How the patient describes it here might be that they're feeling low or blue, that they might be feeling down, 
all of those things are absolutely appropriate to describe the way the person is describing their feelings. However, as the clinician, it's important that you recognize that that is the diagnostic category of a particular disorder. So combined, when you're using the five areas model, it's really important to be clear about your role is understanding the disorder specific information and the emotional category that that fits into. And then the altered feelings box is for the patient's subjective personal view of that. So either model is entirely appropriate to use within services, as long as they're used with full fidelity and with full understanding. So when we talk about emotions and feelings, and this is important for use of the five areas model, and, and we do go into this more in the um, five areas clinicians guide that myself and Chris wrote. Um, Emotions are the kind of core ABC linked to the diagnostic category. But when we talk about feelings, that's the patient's subjective experience that comes after the autonomic, uh, physical, behavioral and cognitive changes. So it's the way they describe their emotion once it's occurred to them. That's what we put in that box. And it is important to use the patient's own la language and words, as I said, as long as you're clear as the clinician, what the diagnostic category is, what the problem based um, presenting problem is to be able to ascertain and put into place the right treatment um, pathway. So we talked about in the anxiety disorders, it's important to, to assess the differences. The easiest way to do that is to get some examples of when the person's recently experienced over the past week to 10 days, an example of feeling particularly anxious, and then to focus in on that time point so where they are, what's going on around them as if it's happening now. And at that point, stop and gather and what we call symptom cluster together, the physiological, autonomic, physical changes they notice in their body and try and link those to one of the fear defense cascades. The behavioral changes that occur, what the person does or doesn't do to try and modify how they're feeling. And also at the point where they felt the most anxious, what thoughts were going through their mind to try and ascertain what the thinking changes and how that links to one of the specific cognitive themes. So this is taken from our clinician's guide to managing panic and it is definitely worth a read if you aren't aware of the fear defense cascades. All of us, including mammals, so humans are absolutely no different in how this occurs. When, when there is some kind of threat in our environment, when we are um, in response to any kind of threatening situation, our body will have a response, the adrenaline response, and many people are familiar with that. But what's happening in the body is before a threat is there, we're in what's called the parasympathetic status in the body our parasympathetic system our rest and digest system keeps our body in homeostasis so everything's good the body is communicating down the, the various um, um circuits that that everything is okay so our um we have a um system within our gut we have a system within our brain and our spine, and we have a system, a, 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 our system that basically does rest and digest or threat. And all of those systems, when we're in um, parasympathetic, are in balance. So that then changes when we go into a threat-based response. So when some kind of threat happens, the body will then produce adrenaline on response to that trigger. And that's what's known as the fear defense cascade. And there are different options according to the situational threat that we're facing. So our body, other mammals' bodies will choose a different form of response based on the level of threat that we're experiencing at the moment. And we have active fear defense cascades and passive fear defense cascades. So, for example, the further away a threat is, the more likely we might be, be to freeze and stay as still as possible to try and assess the situation, to not move and draw attention to ourselves. Similarly, the closer the threat, the more imminent the threat, the more likely it is that we need to take action and spring out of there to try and escape. 
or if necessary to fight our way out of there. So again, different things are needed within the body to respond to those, those two things. In the first, in what we call a freeze response, the body needs to stay as still as possible. In the second, the body needs to take action quickly. We need energy, we need oxygenated blood to the arms and legs to be able to run away or fight. So there are subtly different responses in the anxiety disorders according to the situation and the proximity of the threat. So by gathering recent examples, it really helps us understand what's happening. So I often use a way of describing this about um, a fox and a rabbit. So if a rabbit's just sat in a field very happy eating, it would be in a rest and digest state. So it would be in parasympathetic arousal, rest and digest. All it's thinking about is going back and probably breeding with Mrs. Rabbit. But if it then spots a fox on the horizon two fields away, it will then move into sympathetic arousal. So the sympathetic system will be activated and the rabbit will choose a set of actions based on the autonomic physiological changes that happen in the fear defense cascade, based on where the fox is and the situation that the rabbit is in. So if the rabbit is very close to an exit, it might run, although it's common sense for rabbits to stay as still as possible. You've probably come across the, the rabbit and headlights analogy. If the fox is two fields away, it might not have even seen the rabbit yet. So the rabbit will want to stay as still as possible and it will want to focus its attention on the threat in the future or two fields away. So we're exactly the same. If the threat is further away, if the threat is located in the future, we want to stay as still as possible. We have high autonomic muscle tension and we focus our attention on the content of the threat in the future. So in some disorders, that's a typical response pattern. So after the initial adrenaline release and response happens, we then, stay in a, a freeze-based response and in a freeze-based response some of the autonomic arousal symptoms are actually masked and hidden a physical process takes place to actually keep those from outward expression so rather than breathing um, changing through to the mouth and and you know potentially drawing attention to the rabbit because the breathing might have um might be noticeable with um, the cold air. All of those things um, are done to try and kind of bring that down to signal and to make sure that actually that there's a um, oh, that initial ar arousal response that's happened is actually then hidden. It's 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 masked down a little bit. And the, bo the body will tense the muscles as much as possible. And that can have some secondary impacts as well. If you think about constantly tensing big muscles, like the muscle around your jaw that goes over the top of your head, that can lead to things like tension headaches, which are often commonly experienced in disorders where a freeze-based response is, is normal. Similarly, if the rabbit note looked up and noticed the fox was closer, say he was in the same field, he might try and run away if there's a clear exit, in which case tensing the muscles isn't going to be helpful at that point. The muscles need energy, so glucose will be released in the body. The breathing will change to take in more oxygen, so breathing through the mouth rather than the nose. And all of these things happen so quickly within one three thousandth of a second. So it's not under voluntary control. These things are not, uh, not under conscious control. They're autonomic. They happen to us all and they happen to mammals in the same way in response to a threat. The oxygenated blood will get vasodilation of major blood vessels to get the oxygenated blood going around the body. The heart will bump, pump faster to do that. Blood pressure increases. And similarly, um, blood vessels that aren't as needed or that would divert blood away from where it needs to go to will have vasoconstriction. So they'll constrict slightly to divert blood where it needs to go, the oxygenated blood. And that can sometimes feel unpleasant or difficult for patients and sometimes they misinterpret what's happening there. So it really is worth reading more about the different responses that we can go into and that all mammals can go into in terms of freeze, flight, fight, faint and flop and when they occur what situations they might occur in 
because all of those things will help us to identify when a patient describes for us the situation they're in, actually what physiological differences they're experiencing. And actually, if we move the person to describe a different situation, for example, they've told us about experiencing anxiety out of the home, if we ask them if it ever happens in the home or if we move them to before an event or if we move them to after an event, what physiological arousal state are they describing at that point and how does it subtly differ? Where's their focus of attention? So all of those things, if we understand the fear defense cascades well and we apply that with our knowledge of the specific behaviors and themes can help us come to a disorder specific problem based understanding of the problem. So I really would recommend reading up on the fear defense cascades. And one of the reasons we need to know the differences is because across the anxiety disorders, some things are shared. So for example, these things here. So these aren't disorder specific, they happen across all anxiety disorders. Threat, thinking about threat happens across all anxiety disorders. Being hypervigilant to that threat or preoccupied with it shared across all anxiety disorders. So we've got to make sure it's the specifics that we're trying to understand. Similarly, across all dis anxiety disorders, the way in which behaviours change is shared. So somebody avoids to bring their symptoms down or avoid feeling those symptoms. If they get those symptoms in a situation, they'll often do things to make the situation end more quickly, like rush or um, abandon their shopping and leave a situation, for example, so their escape strategies. But also they'll do things to feel safer, to avert or reduce their threat. So they're what we call safety seeking behaviors. So for example, the person might take someone with them or they might have to take something out with them such as water for a dry mouth. So when someone tells us about a safety seeking behavior or an escape behavior, what we're trying to understand is when they do it and when they don't do it. What makes that difference? What they think would happen if they didn't do that thing? Can they ever manage without that particular thing? So for example, they take medication out with them. Can they ever manage without doing it that? If they only go out in the evenings when it's quiet, what do they predict would happen at a busy time around school um, leaving time at the end of the day, for example? So we're trying to understand the unique W questions, what they do, when they do it, where they do it, if having anybody with them uh, modifies it in any way, and similarly the alternatives to that as well. And all of that we're trying to make sense in terms of the theme of that threat linked to the cognitive theme and the physiological fear defense cascade that the person is experiencing at that time. And by going in and gathering some examples of the situation, it really helps us in funneling to then understand what we call the primary gnat rather than secondary thoughts. So primary gnats are the theme of the threat that we can link to that cognitive theme. So for example, somebody with panic disorder, at the point where they have those symptoms and they're in high autonomic arousal, they're in that active fear defense cascade, at the time they're having those symptoms, their thoughts are a misinterpretation of adrenaline based symptoms as a sign of imminent harm. So right here, right now, my heart is racing. I am having a heart attack and I think I'm going to die. So at that point, their thoughts were that they were going to have a heart attack and that that links in with that theme that we know of panic disorder, of catastrophic misinterpretation of those symptoms that mimic adrenaline or adrenaline based symptoms as a sign of imminent harm. So knowing the cognitive themes is really important and making sure we are assessing in a way that goes in to get the primary negative automatic thoughts where possible. Um, recall of thoughts is always much easier if we put the person back in the situation as if it's happening now in terms of um, making sure that we get I'm talking about it first person as if it's happening and situation specific. Okay, you were anxious on Wednesday. Talk me through Wednesday as if it's happening now. Where are you? What's going on around you? Okay, so you're on the bus. This is happening. At the point where you felt most anxious, what was happening at that point? Okay, just stop at that point for me. And I want you to tell me what's going on physically for you at the moment. So you're there, you're on the bus. It's Wednesday, it's three o'clock. You notice the school children get on the bus. 
if you focus on the point that was most anxiety provoking that, what's going through your mind right now? So by doing that, it really helps the patient recall the thoughts that they had because those thoughts by nature, by the very nature of negative automatic thoughts, they're situation specific. And after the event, the person might go, well, you know, I don't believe that now. I know I wasn't having a heart attack, but at the time when my heart was racing, that's what I thought. And then we can generalize that out and say, well, how typical is that example you've given me on the bus of how your anxiety presents? Are there any other places where it occurs? Or you've mentioned that sometimes it happens even at home. Is there an example of when it's happened at home we could talk through? So these are the cognitive themes of each disorder and it's really worth getting to know these off by heart. So in GAD, the theme is worry, what we call type two worry. So that's worrying about worry itself, starting to worry about how much you're worrying or the consequences of worrying, feeling that they might be going mad as a result of the worrying, for example. So worries about worry is what we call type two or it's occasionally called metacognitive worry, worrying about worrying itself. And the three U's of GAD are uncertainty, unpredictability, and uncontrollability. So people with generalized anxiety disorder struggle with situations that involve any of those three U's, when things are uncertain, unpredictable, or uncontrollable. And if you think about how behavior has a function, behavior adapts to try and manage somebody's symptoms. Therefore, people with GAD tend to prefer situations that are certain situations that are more predictable and situations where they have control. So knowing that theme, spotting that theme and what the patient's telling us in there, um, when they get the opportunity to tell us about their difficulties in their own words, really helps us identify what's happening. And with GAD, it's worry, the worry is future focused. So again, we can link that to the fear defense cascade and the primary physical symptoms in GAD is tension, muscle tension. So again, we can look out and make sense of all of those things together to really come to the right disorder specific diagnostic alongside using our disorder specific measures and our minimum data set that helps check we've got a full understanding of the problem. And different disorders present differently in different situations. So for example, with GAD, it tends to be that the person goes into most regularly a passive fear defense cascade, a freeze-based response. In panic, the, situ the, the fear defense cascade somebody goes to is heightened autonomic arousal. It's, an, it's a, um, an active fear defense cascade. So people will want to avoid or escape and use safety seeking behaviors to manage that particular to that disorder. So again, we're trying to make sense of that. If somebody uses a certain safety behavior, so for example, that they always use the shopping trolley rather than a basket, we're trying to understand why they use the shopping trolley. So having something to hold on might help them feel um, stable in, when they feel dizzy and they think that they might faint or collapse. Whereas another patient with panic, and that's where the idiosyncratic nature comes in, might carry a basket because they want to get out of there as quickly as possible. So it's um, a safety seeking behavior that helps them escape more quickly. They might always go to self-serve rather than having to queue. So it's the patient's unique presentation that we're trying to make sense of, get some examples of the situation and then make sense of the theme. But panic, is an active fear defense cascade each time it occurs. So even in the home, it's an active fear defense cascade, usually because the person has some, what we call panic attacks out of the blue, because even benign sensations of adrenaline can cause the body to initiate this response because they're a sign of, of threat or danger, or they've been learned as a sign of threat or danger. So for example, other times when heart rate goes up, well, that could be going upstairs, it could be sex, it could be exercise. So often those things start to be avoided or start to bring on symptoms. Similarly, in the adrenaline-based response, quite often, you know, because of the vasoconstriction to the gut, sometimes the, or the butterflies can cause the belly to, to um, 
feel like butterflies or to, to flip, those things can happen at neutral times as well as part of digestion. And the body can pick that up as a sign of imminent harm and invoke this response, even in a neutral situation at home. So again, what we're trying to understand is, does it fit the DSM criteria of panic? Whereas when we come to disorders like specific, um, like, sorry, like social anxiety disorder and health anxiety, the lead up to a socially anxious um, situation, so knowing, say, you've got a presentation to do in two weeks, then it's in the future, so it's more likely to be a passive, um, passive fear defence cascade at that point, compared to the time or the day of the presentation and at the presentation when it would be an active response because the threat is closer. And then afterwards, where people do what we call the post-mortem in social anxiety disorder, where they go over what's happened, they're going over it as if it's happening. So again, the way that the body responds physiologically in those different time points, the thoughts in those different time points and the behaviours would differ. So we'd ask somebody with social anxiety disorder about all of those time points. And similarly with health anxiety, the way it presents is different according to the situation. Checking, not finding anything, having found something or waiting for test results after test results when they've been given a negative um, conclusion to those tests. So we might ask about all of those time points to really understand the problem from the patient's perspective and really understand that it is health anxiety, not just worries about health, which can happen in GAD. So we're trying to make sense of it in terms of the real presenting problem, the theme and the physical symptoms and what the person does or doesn't do to link it in. And the one that the theme is different is PTSD because PTSD um, sits outside of the anxiety disorder family, although the person feels extremely anxious, it's an unprocessed memory of a traumatic event. So a bit like a record that's got stuck the event is replaying live as if it's happening now. So the traumatic event keeps popping back into somebody's um, mind, but they experience that with full sensory experience as if it's happening now. So sight, sounds, smells, live as if it's happening, even though the traumatic event is previous to now. Because it hasn't been processed, it keeps popping back in. So it's different and it has a completely different treatment in NICE guidelines in terms of trauma-focused CBT or EMDR, depending on the patient's presentation. And um, with PTSD, if we get signs it's PTSD, there's a specific disorder-specific measure to, keep, to undertake, the PCL5, but we wouldn't funnel the traumatic event itself because that can cause the reliving and high distress. So in an assessment, if it became clear it was PTSD, we wouldn't funnel the actual trauma we would gather details about when it's having an impact on their life now. So when that reliving is happening, what might be triggering it for them and gather just enough detail, ensure it's PTSD on the disorder specific measure and make sure the person's safe with our psychometric and, and risk assessment to then step them up to the appropriate treatment. So that gives a little bit more about the emotions of each disorder and why we need to know those themes, those physiological symptoms and the fear defence cascades. Next, we'll spend some time looking at how we gather information, specific information next in terms of the ABCs and Ws and really getting to grips with that funnelling process.